But I think all of us create our own miracles. On April 8, 1991, Michael Landon called a press conference to announce the shocking news that he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Landon was essentially announcing his own death sentence, but he handled it the way he had managed most of his life, head on. It was that way from day one, and that's why Michael had called a press conference telling everybody what he had so there would not be any speculation and stories and all of that. He just sort of wanted to lay it out on the line from day one. I think every moment just gets a little more important after something like this. He called us at the house and he said, Michael has something. <laughs> Sorry. Cindy said, uh, Michael's got something to tell you that's not good. No, I'm okay. I cried then, I'm crying now. Because it wasn't good. He meant an awful lot to a lot of people. And, uh, There'll never be another one like him, never. He was genuine, he cared for people. He was the sweetest man I ever know. Things that you probably wouldn't notice become important. Word of Landon's illness ricocheted around the world, and before long, the post office was deluged with stacks of mail, thousands of letters a week, no one was more surprised than Michael himself. Michael never looked at himself as a, as a star, as a big star. Um, and I know that this house was filled with boxes of letters and books. And I remember we were sitting there one day reading. He was looking through some of the letters. And I think he was very touched by the fact that he had felt that he had actually had and made a difference in the lives of some people because of his shows. That meant a lot to him. For the past month, he has uh, continued to face this battle with humor and honesty and a, a personal sense of dignity that characterizes the man. Would you welcome Michael Landon? Some of the letters were sympathetic, and some suggested the most far-out therapies imaginable. Landon chose to talk about one of his favorites during his final appearance on The Tonight Show which became one of the highest rated Tonight Shows of all time. So one guy wrote me, he told me that the reason you got it, yeah. you got the big C, was that I did not get enough sex. <laughs> See, he thinks it was only the nine times when I what had to kid. <laughs> Michael had been a guest of The Tonight Show many times, and in private, he and Johnny Carson were close personal friends. But this visit was clearly different for Landon. This time, he had something he wanted to get off his chest about the tabloid press. It seems so totally insensitive to me, especially since, how do they know what my little kids have been told in my own home, that, that a tabloid would write four weeks left, or it's over. Can you imagine that? Well, the tabloids have never I mean, been known, can you known for their decency or sensitivity. I mean, it's unbelievable that people can be that way. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a cancer. Jennifer told me um, just a couple weeks ago that after we said Dad had cancer, she said, you know, Mom, I went in my room and cried, never said anything because I knew Dad probably wasn't going to make it. So we wanted to protect her, but we also wanted not to have them think that Dad was going to be alive if there was a possibility. He wasn't. We, did, we wanted to be very honest with him. I remember, like, he would explain it to us in terms that we could understand, especially for my brother, because he was so little. He was really young. And, like, my brother said that he wished that my dad was a crab so that he could cut through the clouds and come back down. Landon had been feeling ill for quite some time. In retrospect, his daughter Leslie realized that something was seriously wrong at her wedding just a few months earlier. So now that I look back, and he was probably sick at that time with, the, with pancreatic cancer, it was probably one of my most wonderful days in my life was 
my wedding day with my whole family and it was it really was it was like it was a magical day for me yeah it was I feel very lucky that way because I know I have I have younger siblings sorry I'm just thinking of Jennifer you know I was just thinking you know she won't have that experience she wouldn't have my dad doing that with her Landon's life was becoming completely chaotic. Every move he made, reporters and photographers were waiting. Publicly, Landon had always said he would fight cancer until the very end. Some of his closest friends knew otherwise. You know, I was a little worried about this interview tonight. You've made me feel much better <laughs> with your attitude. Michael Landon's appearance on The Tonight Show with his good friend Johnny Carson was surprisingly uplifting. Though facing the bleakest of futures, Landon found humor in the worst situations. I asked before I went if there was anything that he wanted, and they told me that all he really cared about doing at that point was laughing, which was very important to him. I spent, you know, 10 years basically crawling around on the ground laughing with tears streaming down my face because of him. It was very hard to see this man who, you know, was this big, tough guy who put cigarettes out in his hand, who to me always looked like an upside down triangle. He was so built and so strong and he never wore a shirt. And, you know, he was just this vital, solid guy. And he was so sick and so gray in, in his skin and, and so weak and in, just, it wasn't him. Landon was undergoing conventional treatment while also experimenting with alternative therapies. Oh, you coffee taking enemas. taking coffee in a, in... Oh, I take coffee enemas. Anybody out there ever heard of a coffee enema? Yes, I've heard of it. <laughs> huh, you must be fun at breakfast, wasn't you? Yes. <laughs> he was starting to feel better when doctors gave Landon the sobering news that the cancerous growth had actually doubled in size. That's when he decided to pull the plug on his aggressive medical treatments. We did have a couple of discussions about this, about the medicine, and, uh, and I still feel myself that there, are, there is medicine available, and so did Cindy, and, and, uh, and he felt that uh, common medical knowledge at the time had more or less consigned him to the scrap heap he was about to be through, and so he wanted to give up and get, let, let everybody get on with their lives. Uh, and uh, that was frustrating. I think he began to realize that uh, he then had a choice of how much pain he was going to be in and how much he would be able to enjoy his family during the last time. And family was such an important part of his life that uh, his choice was very simple. He said, I want to be able to spend some time with, with my kids and, and, uh, and with my wife. You know, he didn't want to he didn't want to spend that time dazed and, and uh, not able to really communicate. So uh, the end result was that uh, uh, he really probably suffered quite a bit in the last part of his life. I thought to myself, this is not very good. And he knew it. We all knew it. But, you know, there's always this feeling in your heart that when you love somebody, it's going to be all right. And somehow, because he was invincible to us, he could do anything. He would do anything. He'd chance anything. He'd go anywhere. So you never felt that anything was going to happen to him. But we were wrong. Once the press got wind that the end was near, a ghoulish death watch began outside the Landon compound. Landon passed away quietly on July 1st, 1991, at the age of 54. It was terrifying to think that the privacy of someone who was ill and who had died and the family who had just experienced it was experiencing a war zone. I looked out the window and there's a helicopter is circling overhead and just trying to shoot down and people were lined up on the street. I called a friend of, I knew at the sheriff's department and they had a, just a regular van from the undertaker. And we took down a part of a fence, and they backed it in and under a port so that we could 
get him out without anybody seeing him. My husband did the best he could to make sure that it was not caught on tape. Unfortunately, uh, in the moment, Cindy was very upset and very emotional and ran after the van as it was leaving. And they caught it. And of course, at the time, she didn't know. And it was probably the furthest thing from her mind. But it was terrible. It was terrible. Landon had meant to make a videotape to say goodbye to each of his children. But he became too weak, too fast. But he had composed a letter for his wife, Cindy. It was on Mother's Day, and it was his wishes for me um, about my life, basically, you know, and hoping that he would be here uh, f five, ten years from now that we, you know, we could sit and read this together. But it was basically him telling me these are things that I feel and things that I wish for you when I'm not here. One person who chose not to visit Landon during his final days was his second wife, Lynn, to whom he had been married for 19 years. Lynn told her children that their divorce had already been like a death to her. And when death eventually claimed Michael Landon, Lynn was one of the few who chose not to attend his memorial. It was, it was a day of, of tremendous emotion and ups and downs and of sharing favorite stories, uh, uh, of talking about the difference that Michael had made in our lives. If there was a message Michael had for his friends and family, they knew it was best expressed in a line he wrote for Little House in the Prairie, which was read by actress Patricia Neal. Remember me with smiles and laughter, for that's how I'll remember you all. If you can only remember me with tears, then don't remember me at all. Michael Landon passed away a mere three months after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He was only 54 years old. In many ways, Landon's death served to unify the family he had left behind, but it also caused significant splinters in the Landon family tree. The immediate issue was Landon's multi-million dollar estate. Who got what? Some children went public with complaints, Others hired independent auditors to review Landon's financial records. The estate plan didn't satisfy everyone. When you have as many uh, beneficiaries, children in this case, as Michael, um, you're bound to have uh, different interpretations of what is right and what isn't. Certainly by my standards, and I, I think by most people's standards, he left each of his children wealthy. The Landon family feud had become a tabloid staple, and after his death, there was a morbid curiosity about his rich young widow, Cindy Landon. For several years after her husband's death, tabloid photographers followed her every step. Oh yes, there was a lot of effort, to, for some reason, to scandalize her. Uh, independent photographers and uh, writers would try and find something to sell their story to the various tabloids. So they literally followed her in cars whenever she went out. Out to a restaurant, there'd be a couple of cars of uh, photographers parking right behind her. I mean, it's... Cindy finally moved her two children to the south of France for a year to escape all the public scrutiny. But within a decade, Michael Landon's name was back in the public spotlight, and some say being dragged through the mud. In the spring of 1999, Michael Landon Jr. unveiled an unflattering portrait of his father in a highly rated television movie. Mike and I spoke about the movie. He, he told me what he was doing, and um, he felt that this was something that he needed to do. And basically, it was um, something that he thought he could do for his career. The movie focused on Landon's divorce from his second wife, Lynn, and marriage to his third wife, Cindy. Landon was portrayed as a selfish and callous man. TV Guide even wondered whether the portrayal should be called Daddy Dearest. Michael Landon Jr. wrote and directed the story. At least I hope it, that it's a very balanced, very truthful um, story. 
I believe television has a right to do whatever they want in terms of fiction. That's what television's about. I don't think it's fair to uh, fictionalize real life. Action! It's always easy to say there's a dark side after somebody's dead because he can't fight back. I doubt very much if anybody would want to say that if he was alive. Mike Jr. traded on his father's name in order to jumpstart a career as a director. But his version of events struck many family friends as wildly inaccurate. And privately, they were heartsick that Mike Jr. had tarnished his father's reputation. Landon himself had never claimed to be a saint. Be good to each other and don't judge each other. We've all got our problems. Thanks to three decades on television, exemplifying strong, idealistic characters, Landon had always been held to a higher standard. He had come a long way from the lonely, miserable childhood he had endured as a scrawny little boy named Eugene Orowitz. He had invented a new name and a new life for himself as a handsome young star called Michael Landon. Then he took that name and turned it into a brand name, making it synonymous with wholesome family entertainment. Along the way, he strove to create the loving family he had always wanted. His mother was physically abusive with him um, and very emotionally abusive. I think he still hurt about some of those things that happened in his past because they were quite painful. When his mother died, I think he had a sense of relief at that time, but I think there was also still that sense of loss, you know, of things that could have been different. But somewhere in the process, he basically said, what matters is family, what matters is relationship, what matters is uh, uh, people connecting. It always amazes me how people who are so lonely, so devoid of love in their lives, still consider themselves successful. Mike was the kind of guy that if you uh, met him for the first time, he would impress you because he had such an energy around him. People talk about auras. Uh, I don't know that I believe in that or not, but I know around Michael there was such an energy that everybody that met him was captivated. Little kids that... He loved kids. He thought they were so honest and genuine and just so he could be who he was and he didn't have to be... People weren't looking at him like, you know, this movie star. They were more honest with him, more real. I remember Michael as being the happiest, craziest. I never saw anybody with such a quick wit in my life. It didn't matter what you were talking about. He had a joke for it. We got in the card game AC Ducey, and all Michael wanted to be sure of is Jay left the airplane with no money. And Jay was Michael's business manager, so when we took all of Jay's money, Michael stopped the game so Jay could not earn the money back. When we arrive at the hotel, Michael tells the bellman, take all the luggage to Jay Eller's room. Jay had already gone up to his room. And the bellman says, fine. So Michael and I hide in the hallway, and we're behind a door and all the luggage to deliver to um, Jay's room. He doesn't have a dime to tip the guy. He's embarrassed like you would not believe. And um, the bellman leaves. Michael and I come out from behind the door. Michael gives the bellman an unbelievable tip. And he says to him, do me a favor, go back to the man's room and complain. And so the bellman knocks on Jay's door. Jay's already embarrassed. And the bellman says, you know, anybody can afford to stay in a fancy hotel like this can afford a tip. And Jay is bright red and completely embarrassed. And Michael was just cracking up. And he kept telling everybody, that's my business manager. That's the guy who handles my investments. Um, Every time I call my son Michael, I can kind of hear him laugh, probably thinking you named him after me. What are you, nuts? Couldn't you have named him after Winston Churchill or somebody who did something really good? Because I don't take life so seriously. Take your tasks, you know, your work seriously. Don't take yourself so seriously. He was really into that. Don't get hung up in yourself. One of his theme songs. Michael was a pragmatist. He knew that the minute they told him that that was the final sentence, he indulged the rest of us by following through and, and with some pursuit of alternative remedies um, but in his heart, as well as his mind, he knew that um, the responsible doctors that told him he had two months to live, without equivocation, would not have told him that if it wasn't true. 
So uh, the rest of the, the, the motions that he went through, and he did go through them, he tried, but they were, they were for the rest of us, you know. I just remember, um, I remember there was one distinct moment though when my brother was helping my dad up the back staircase and he was carrying my dad's oxygen tank and watching them both go up the back stairs. That moment for me was a, a release of, um, I mean, it was a, lo a lot of release of emotions, but I realized at that point that he really was going to die and that I needed it. I needed to let that be okay because he, I could tell he was suffering and that was not the quality of life that he wanted for himself. I mean, he was ready to go. There's a whole new generation of young people growing up with Little House out there. And I think they love it as much as uh, the last generation did. And I hope that that goes on and on and on because uh, it, it's one of the very special legacies that Michael has left to us. He set a standard that I would like to have seen the rest of the, <laughs> the television industry follow for family entertainment. He hate the word sweet or saccharine, but you know, if it reaches the heart, it plays. Live every minute, guys. Melissa Gilbert and husband Bruce Boxleitner consider their child a miracle. He was born 12 weeks premature, weighed three pounds, and spent his first six weeks in a hospital. When it came to naming the baby, Melissa called him Michael, after another fighter who had meant so much to her. Melissa and many others remain upset by the television movie directed by Michael Landon Jr. The younger Landon was widely accused of making a profit while destroying his father's image and reputation.